Hello, everyone. We're live at Epic Games. I'm Stacy Conley. Steve Polch. Jim Brown. David Spolinski. We're glad you're here with us today. Uh, today we're going to talk about Stacey's level design. back. Yay. I'm back. Uh -huh. I know you didn't miss me because Celia was here. <laughs> <laughs> but today we're going to talk about le level design. Mm -hmm. And um, first of all, we wanted to say thanks to Brian, who is also known as at Meathead Militia over at War Gaming. We want to thank him for our swag. And... We also want to thank Ian Shadden, one of our tech writers, and he, if you want to know how to set up Unreal Tournament so you can either play or help us develop it, uh, we have an address for you. Cam is going to post that on the stream. And, and if it's not there, you can go to the wiki and you can find it on the, the yes, Unreal Tournament Yes, everything wiki. on the wiki. And don't forget, if you write any tutorials, add them to the wiki. We're, we'd love to have them. So let's dive right into level design. Cool. We have some pictures for you. Um, we have a new, brand new deck. And yeah, it's so looking really good. <laughs> one of the things that we wanted to do when we started this project was to go back and look at kind of our all the previous Unreal games that we had done um, and kind of get a sense of, of what we wanted to improve, specific areas we wanted to improve, um, and then how to roll that all forward and, and how to have kind of a good measuring stick to check and see how does this feel compared to previous games. And uh, Deck 16 has been kind of a staple of the franchise since Unreal 1, even before Unreal Tournament. Love um, that It's map. kind of been one of the featured maps that's been in, in pretty much every game. That's how I got my name. Really? Because there's flax all over the place. all over the place, yes. <laughs> um, I was like, your name is not Deck? What are you talking about? <laughs> 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 um, so anyway, so uh, that was the first map that we brought over. Um, and the, the originally, I just did a straight port from... Uh, UT99 and ported it over to Unreal Engine 4. Um, but then recently, as we started to take a closer look at movement, um, I wanted to make sure that um, all of uh, everything felt right. So when we were looking at dodge distances and jump heights, and wow, it's really coming It's down. really raining here. You probably, probably can't hear, but it's raining on the roof above us. Um, so I wanted to make sure that everything was felt right compared to the previous games, or felt different in the way that we wanted it to feel different. Um, so I went ahead and rebuilt the map from scratch um, at our current game scale. Um, and I've kind of slowly been finding more and more bugs as we've gone along, brushes that I missed, areas that I think. Uh, so if you find anything else, uh, please let me know. Um, and then after I rebuilt it, uh, Chris, our art director, took a swing at it and figured, oh, well, this is a perfect opportunity to start looking at surfaces and lighting and things like that. So we just put some real basic materials on there so you can differentiate floor from wall and things like that. So it's, it's not by any means representative of what we want the final product of our game to look like um, or any art direction or anything other than this is strictly meant to be a test bed for us to test um, how light reflects off materials, how players move through a space, and we wanted to do it in, in a way that um, we all had a really good measure of so we can compare it to previous games. Yeah, I think that's the key with deck is is that it is a good measuring stick. And for I guess most of the guys watching the stream here, you've probably played maybe multiple UTs, and yeah, you know its presence has been in all of them. And you know having it in there is something that we can use to play and go, okay, how does this compare to uh, where we've been before? And you know what is uh, the current Unreal Tournament's gameplay like compared to those? So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and where we want to take it, and also where 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 any changes we make can be seen in that map uh, versus deck, any new ones. Yeah, you fall and, into habits, you know. And yeah. You, you well, the deck is a really good map because it's 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 a good one on one map. It's a good team deathmatch map. Um, it has some really kind of what I would consider to be hardcore gameplay, and that you know it's it's a really good map for setting up. Uh, uh, a pattern to run in and you can kind of do some item control and weapon control and figure out shortcuts and, and timings and things like that. But it's also very accessible because it's so open and, and yeah. easy to understand. And it also has the slime, which is kind of, and a teleporter, which is kind of gimmicky and it has all the weapons. And so anyway, it's, it's just like a really good <laughs> representative of, of all the things that, that, that you'll find in a Unreal Tournament map. And we have a, a loop running on our TV in our office and we have yeah. one of the one of the guys from uh, I think he's from Beyond not not Beyond Unreal from Pro Unreal Mess Mess TV and we have him running through this map and it, it, just watching him is pretty amazing him move through the maps and, and grabbing all the items and the pickups. 
Yeah, so again, if you notice anything there that doesn't feel right uh, for some reason, shoot us a message, post on the forums, grab a video, whatever. Let grab a video know. is the best thing, um, too. We, we want to hear about it. We want to know. I just found something today, actually, and, and fixed another spot uh, where there was a jump you should not you should have been able to make and, and couldn't, um, even though it was kind of a tricky, complicated thing. But um, Sydney, one of our other d designers, uh, uh, you may know him as Clawfist. Clawfist. He's been around forever. Uh, he found a couple more spots for me, and I fixed those this morning. Um, there are have been a few minor updates to uh, layout in terms of ammo placement and armor and a couple things. Um, and that was purely just me trying to mess with the gameplay a little bit and see what we could do. Um, sometime down the road, I plan on doing some uh, weapon balance changes, and, and that's kind of getting prepped for that, but we haven't made any real changes there yet. So and this that's one coming includes the, uh, the flak connecting room also. Yeah, I added the, the flak room that came in uh, UT 2004. Um, it was also there in UT 3. And again, it's scaled slightly differently than that version, but the whole game is... Um, and the bulk of this map is built to UT-99 uh, dimensions, and then I just upped it to uh, the current game scale. But yes, that room is, is in there for sure. So Yeah, and speaking of deck, there's a pretty cool uh, version where someone's added uh, a few new elements and made some adjustments. Yeah, Chong Lee. Yeah. <coughs> he did Amazing, a really right? cool version, yeah. So um, again, we don't want people to go back and remake all the old maps, but he did a really good job of taking the map and updating it and adding a lot of new elements yeah. and a lot of new game flow um, and really kind of turned it into its own brand new thing. It was really, really cool. So. Well, what's interesting to me about about that take on it is that to have most of the same elements as, as it relates to movement in there uh, from the original deck, like walking up on the ramp and dodging down to get to you damage and other things like that, like it's got that and then you add new com new elements in there and you can kind of test the movement and the the sort of platform elements against the old elements in the same map and yeah. see that they're both still really fun. Um, and uh, that's one thing that kind of has me excited about that is it sort of proves that, you yeah. know, going forward we, we can create really interesting uh, movement and platforming gameplay uh, with uh, with our current movement. So. Yeah, and, and in terms of, of how to move forward, I mean, right yeah. now we are very, very much in the experimental phase. So doing things like that, I think, is a great idea where um, you can see, you know, how, do I, how to make a small change to an existing layout and see what it does, you know, just changing, um, playing with, with trick jumps and, and things like that are great. Um, you don't have to go build this elaborate, you know, team deathmatch map that supports 32 players and has every weapon in its own room and all this other stuff. It's, it's fine to make just <laughs> one room and see how how much fun you can have in that one room. Make a quick arena map. Uh, build off of it as, as ideas come to you. You don't have to have these elaborate plans. Yeah. Um, we, we tend to plan them out a little, or at least Dave does, tends to plan them out a little bit further in advance than that, but... Usually it doesn't work. <laughs> but Usually when I yeah. when I when I'm really excited about like a drawing of a complete map and then I build the whole thing, it doesn't work. But it's like if it, you know, there are uh, sketches all over Dave's desk. Yeah. Or but if it's like if I draw out like a room that I think could be really cool, I, usually I can build a whole map around that. But I don't know. Yeah, it, you never it's, know. It's always you, you'll a notice the that dice. the first map we had in was C08, which means it was the third, the eighth revision of the third idea that you had yeah. before something kind of fell together, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, that's definitely true. As far as anybody that wants to to you know build mm. build maps is you know be willing to it, it be okay to throw out ideas or revise mm. and and uh, iterate on your own ideas. It's expecting it to be right the first time is is uh, it's kind of unrealistic. Uh, you know, you'll, it might happen once in a blue moon, but most of the time you're going to have to evolve what you're working on considerably. Uh, yeah, me, me, me personally, a designer, and I think this is kind of a general philosophy yeah. at Epic, too, is that we'll make a quick sketch, we'll toss around ideas, we'll talk about things, but the real proof for us is when we can actually get in the game and play it. And our entire tool set is, tool set is built around really, really quick iteration, so you can get in and test something and see whether or not it's working, and then make changes and test again very quickly. Um, and even ourselves in the office, when we do our 4 p.m. play tests, a lot of times it's Throw up a build, okay, this doesn't work, make a quick change, yeah. everybody sinks, and then we try it again. We did that um, pretty recently with Nick's uh, deathmatch uh, level that he yep. made, where we play tested it, 
uh, and then immediately made some adjustments, pulled it down, changed where I think the we have shield belt was and everything. Some shots mm -hmm. of that one, don't we? No, wait, that's oh, that sorry. stage map. I think, yeah. yeah, I think also, you know, we're still in the process of refining movement yeah. and, change, and changing movement. And there's a lot of, of interplay between that and the levels, where yeah. the levels are built around how our movement is now, but then we go in and we tweak movement based on, oh, it'd be nice to be able to do this in this level. Yeah. So there's a lot of, but then once we do that, then the levels, once we change something, the levels have to be adjusted to balance that. I just added um, uh, slope boosting, slope, dod yeah. slope dodging today, and uh, I was using your, your FC. Excited for oh, yeah, the one the, in the, oh, like, the shock rifle area. So I found area, instead yeah. of a cool, couple of cool different uh, things you could do and just kind of tweak that, and yeah. then we'll have to see how that works and yep. play with it and yeah. decide if it's something we want. That's not a reason not to experiment. I mean, that's the yeah. whole point, yeah. right, is we want to build something and then see how it breaks and how it can be better and then we fix it, whether that's fixing yep. the movement or fixing the weapons or fixing yeah. the level itself and then iterate again. So yeah. Yeah. Um, best practice is to keep trying, right? Yeah. Like just because it doesn't work, don't give up. Do we have anybody else who's in the forums making maps too? Yeah, there's a ton of forums. So, so this weekend on Twitter, I actually sent out a challenge saying, hey, people send me a map and I'll work with you and we can like go back and forth where you start it and then I'll add to it and we can go back and forth. Um, and there was a I got really good response, actually. Great. There's a bunch of maps in there. Sadly, I haven't had the time to go back and do that, but I definitely do want to sometime this week or early next week um, and actually devote an entire day to doing, finding one or two people where I can actually just go back and forth like that. So um, if you want to do that and you're interested, let me know. Um, send me a PM on the forums or something, and uh, we'll work it out. It's not something I'm going to do for a long time where I'm responding to every single person who sends me a map, but I would love to spend some time just to Maybe in a couple kind of jumpstart the process and, and, and get people going on that. Yeah, that kind of collaboration is what uh, Works. was really, really worked well for the community bonus packs that we saw they released <coughs> for yeah. Unreal Tournament 2003, That's exactly 2004, what and, past, and, yeah. Yeah, and UT3, where groups of guys would get together and they would be willing to say, all right, I started this map, I'll send you the file, do you have any ideas, and then somebody will help with it. And and the end result ended up being stronger than it Those just, maps were fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's also ex exactly how we work here. And, you know, we'll start, a, somebody will start a map and then somebody else will make a change to it and then somebody else will add visuals and somebody else will add lighting and then somebody else will change the gameplay and somebody yeah. else will do weapons and it all just kind of falls together. Yeah, after a while, we stopped sort of uh, writing like, oh, this map has one author because yeah. we had, it's like, you know, a bunch of people ended up working on it. It was a team effort and it was just, hey, here's a cool map that's, you know, uh, yeah. collectively made by a group of people. Um, and uh, so definitely don't be, uh, you know, afraid to ask for help or to collaborate with others that are out there that you think have good sensibilities that maybe you don't have because, you know, in the end of your collaboration, you may have sort of, uh, you know, gleaned some of the things that, uh, that that they have and they've learned from you as well. So, We also have some screenshots of Dave's first kind of test map that we put together. Oh, yeah. um, did you want to talk about how you made uh, some of the choices you made in there and things we learned in the this process? This is the first time so, we got to play. Yeah, this, I mean, this map actually is a kind of a good example of, of uh, growing a little bit organically, uh, which is I started with an idea for... Uh, I guess the the sort of center room, and then built out from there. Um, and the center room. Uh, there was a lot of iteration on. I, I, at this point, I wanted to learn about what would be the right sizes and scales to create um, uh, good gameplay. And the overall size of the map is small. Like I think it totally caps out at about probably six players, and and it might get a little bit tight in there. It's it's probably better as, you know, something like four, three, or even a one-on-one -on -one map. Um, it was perfect for uh, the number of people we had in the office. In the, in the, in the room, playtesting <laughs> yes. the current All screaming the at each other at the same time. And it then when perfect. we invited more people into our playtest, we went, oh, this isn't as fun. Um, uh, but mainly it was more of a, let's, let's figure out what some of the sizes will work. And uh, originally it had gr uh, the world grid material on there. And these screenshots here show we just applied like a basic concrete um, which kind of helps your eyes a little bit. But uh, um, as far as uh, the grid goes, it helps you see the size of certain elements in the world. And, um, you know, you can start to use that as sort of like a ruler for uh, managing the expectations that uh, you will have for the level when you build it. Yeah, we, even with uh, deck, 
we used four colors because we had exactly four different materials uh, yeah. to choose from. Uh, so we applied them judiciously, but we always try and do that even in an early shell is we'll put you know one color on the floors and one color on the walls or you know highlight certain elements with a different color. No, nothing fancy just to kind of help help your eyes uh, adjust to depth and, and really kind of make out uh, different shapes and things in the heat of combat. Yeah, I tend to go a little bit, but uh, this is just my personal choice, but I tend to go a little uh, beyond what most people do when they're kind of just roughing out an idea, uh, you know, shelling out a map, uh, you know, it's kind of what we call it, like creating the BSP shell or the, the white box. Um, but mainly because I like to include some scale elements in there. It gives a sense of, of, uh, of depth to the world um, so that you understand how far away something is and, um, you know, how fast you're moving through the world. And if you, if, if you kind of just use large plain boxes, it's a little bit harder to figure out exactly how big that room is. And it tends to end up meaning that you build things larger than they need to be. And then that can have an overall negative impact on gameplay where you end up like pixel hunting and things like that. Yeah. Um, so even if it takes a little bit extra effort or even if it's just, you know, duplicate a cube that represents what you think is a good crate, the size of a crate, throw some of them in your level even if you don't expect to keep them in there and then you'll get an idea of, oh, wow, this room is bigger than I thought it was going yeah. to be. And can, you, can you go back to the screenshot real quick for us? So another thing that I, I like that Dave does really, really well is if you look at this shot here, you'll see there's three just cubes that are, you know, the columns in the front and then there's four more going on in the background there. Um, they're all essentially the same size. They're just rotated. And what that means is when it comes time to make adjustments, um, there's a consistency there to the, to the way that the world feel, looks and feels. And um, when it comes time to replace those with um, static mesh assets or more complicated visual aspects, um, you only have to create one object that can then go through and just be uh, duplicated throughout the level. Um, so it's not like you have to custom build every piece of the map. And that really helps speed up the process um, and adds Later a, on, a yeah. very nice consistency uh, to the world and, and the way that the map feels and reads to a new player. So that's doing things like that where you you pick a shape um, and then use that as a theme and stick with it, even if it's just a cube like that. Um, but it'll help you ensure that uh, the entirety of your map is built to a consistent scale. Yeah, that, you'll see that in kind of uh, the the test map F08, um, where I used kind of like this similar subtraction. I put similar <coughs> lighting in all those spots. And even if the end result is that it won't exactly look that way, it meant that every place where I utilized that subtraction uh, would mean that the hallway or the area that, that was there would be the same scale throughout the map. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of look at that, you know, BSP is powerful because it's kind of like molding, working with clay, and you can kind of do whatever you want and quickly change it. You're not work constrained to using set asset sizes and things. And so uh, restricting yourself uh, to be consistent while you're working with that clay is, is kind of a... Um, one of those things where, uh, you know, I like to say, like, just because you can doesn't mean you should sort of thing. It was like, just because you can use BSP to make every little thing of your map completely different doesn't mean you should do it that way. Yeah. You know, pay for it in the, the sort of latter stages of, of polishing your map up. And you'll notice here that, like, uh, on either side of the rocket launcher, those hallways are, uh, they, or those passages, the, the ceiling there is high enough that you can double jump without hitting your head. And we went through a lot of work to figure out what that height would be. And that's also the height that's here. That's also the height that's um, the doorway above the super health here. Yeah. It's also the, the doorways that are on either side here that you, you, or the passages underneath. Um, and again, it's, it helps build that kind of uh, uh, dictionary of, of shapes and sizes that you can then just repeatedly use throughout and, and, and help with consistency. Yeah, more than anything, that was actually probably the goal with this level exercise was to learn what are those sizes that feel right. Yeah. Um, and then it just so happened that, you know, after a while, I'll go overboard and try to make it a, make it something you can play. Um, and, uh, you know, because that's, that's kind of important. And my, my uh, goal was to try to find those sizes that felt fun, but, um, you know, were as tight as possible, you know, as small as possible. So... Uh, uh, without ever feeling cramped or ever, you know, being something you would snag on or, uh, you know, being a negative to your experience. Uh, 
because I like the sort of intimate feel of uh, you know the uh, deathmatch spaces, especially uh, since you don't have things like translocator to fling yourself across the map. Uh, I like being able to engage with players that are feel like they are close by, so that a range of weapons can work. Because you know you don't want to be stuck where yeah. you're only ever with the lightning gun or the sniper rifle or or something, or the minigun, or something like that. Yeah, we, that's another thing, is we always try and build spaces that, we typically don't just build a space just to build a space, we build it with a specific weapon or power-up in mind. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so you, you want the person to grab the sniper and then bring it up to a high area, or maybe you want them to already have that high ground when they get there, depending on how you want your map to, to play out. And I don't think that people necessarily understand how much work we or thought we actually put into these sorts of things. Um, even back on Gears, we would measure, oh, how far can I throw this grenade? Okay, well, we'll keep those hallways a certain distance. Or what's the arc on the boom shot of the flat cannon? Okay, well, that's the exact distance that we want this this uh, hallway to be. Or you know, we want enough height there that it can arc without hitting the ceiling and things like that. So yeah. um, when you're planning a space, uh, be sure and have keep in mind what's going to be happening in that space and what people are going to do there and how they're going to actually interact and, and touch that world um, because that environment becomes <coughs> as much a, like a player in the game uh, as as the, the as other people actually do. Yeah, what it really comes down to is like test the and the location with all the guns and make sure that it's fun to use those guns in in most of the locations. It's okay to make one area more fun to use a gun than in other areas of the map, but really when you think about it making your level per being perceived as a good level, it's, it's making it so that it's fun to shoot guns and fun to move around and fun to sort of make uh, decisions uh, using the flow of the map that uh, give you an advantage over your opponent. And it's like those sort of three things combined make a good map. Mm -hmm. um, and so even if you have some crazy idea for like, oh, I'm going to do, you know, a castle in a, in a uh, like a, the middle of a volcano or whatever, and that sounds cool, um, if you can't bring those three elements in addition to that, you know, that theme or that setting, it might only be a theme and it might, you know, it, it might not be that fun yeah. to actually play it. We were actually talking about this earlier, like looking back at some of the most memorable UT99 maps, uh, like uh, Coos Galleon is a, is a really good example of a map that we don't think anyway was super fun to play. Um, but <laughs> it's incredibly memorable. Like everybody goes, "Oh, that's the ship map, right?" Yeah. Like, hey, everybody remembers the map where you're out on the ocean and everything's yeah. rocking, and it was really cool. Um, so nice. that theme can get you so far. Yeah. But if you want a map to really kind of stick around and not just be memorable for what it looked like, but also how it played, um, like deck. I mean, I can't even tell you how many hundreds of hours I have invested in that map. Yeah. Um, or face is another good one um, that. The, the the map is memorable for what it is visually, but also because of the gameplay that was there and how it held up in so many different gameplay situations in different ways. Yeah. Another thing a th good theme can do is help you learn the layout of the map. Yeah. And I think I always find it much easier yeah. to learn a map if I recognize Landmarks. different areas and I realize, okay, this is how I get to the engine room or whatever, you know, from here. And when it when it's just a bunch of rooms that all look kind of the same, it's yeah. harder for me to completely internalize the, the layout. You want that landmarking, and, yeah. and sometimes you can get away with that by have, making, you know, take a room, if you've built an all in, interior space, you know, take a couple of rooms and punch a hole and make it o open to the sky, or, yeah. or mm -hmm. you know, uh, put some sort of memorable item in there, uh, not item, but rather like decorative item. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's definitely quite a few things you can do to make that kind of stuff stand yeah. out, but, uh, you know, that's, and the overall flow of your map can can uh, and layout of it can impact that too. Like deck has something going for it, which uh, you know I've tried to achieve a few times um, recently without success. Which was I wanted to try to make uh, an idea where it was it had, you had a central space uh, oh, that yeah, connected to, it, yeah. with connecting areas around <clears throat> it, and, and deck sort of does that great. Which is like you always know where you are relative to the main main room in in deck and. Uh, and so it doesn't matter if you're in uh, the double lift area or, or the, the flak bio pit or whatever. You kind of, you're always on the stone's throw from the main room. And uh, that right there achieves, you know, sort of landmark status and you only need one of them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, you know, you think of a map like, uh, like Tempest or something, which is a, you know, it's about five 
or so main rooms with connecting hallways and things, and you kind of have to, you can really kind of get lost in that map unless you've played it a lot of times. And, um, and while each room has its own distinctive characteristics, it's, I would say it's a little bit more it difficult to learn that, that map yeah. than it is to learn something like deck. Yeah, the, the bigger the map is, the more complicated it gets, the, the harder it is to learn yeah. the space, too. Uh, the other thing that we were talking about is that everybody kind of has their own style, um, and, and not just sticking within the visual themes of the game itself. Uh, but I, I always yeah. tease, Dave, tease Dave that I can look at one of his maps and, and tell immediately that he was the one who built it just by looking at the BSP. Once it's, once it's meshed out, it's a little bit different, but looking at some of those classic maps... Like, hey, I can, I can tell you exactly which maps were Misha's just by the way that they're built. Yeah. Um, I can tell you exactly which ones Cedric built just by the way that they're built or the, you know, the crazy ideas or whatever. They have the unreal theme, but they also have their own style within that. Um, and so figuring out what your style is is, is very important um, and, and kind of learn to play to those strengths, which is it's no, like, magic formula where I can tell you, hey, this is how you make your map better, but um, really kind of figuring out what works for you uh, is is very important to I think a successful map because you'll once you identify that you'll get a better understanding of what that gameplay is and then how everything kind of starts to tie together. Yeah, and I think it's okay to be kind of a little unapologetic about your style too, which is oh absolutely. That I know uh, you know when I was sort of just learning to sort of Im improve my my uh, early work. I was kind of intimidated by other people's style, and I was trying to sort of copy people. Yeah. And and I, I but it, it was always something in my head was like, mm, this isn't the way that I feel like I should be doing this. And uh, so I think it's okay for people to have their own style. Like I think you know, like you said, you can pick out certain guys' maps, yeah. and even people in the community. Like I think you can pick out a Horrence's map or a, or David M map or mm -hmm. something like yeah. that. And you know that's cool. That's their style, and and you play their map, and you kind of get a, a different take on uh, on the gameplay for mm -hmm. the game. So yeah. uh, we have no, one other map here, another one of Dave's maps that we've actually been testing, and this one's uh, a little bit bigger, yeah, than the original test map. And I think this one actually embraces more what the game is as opposed to just finding the scale yeah. of yeah. things. This one's so um, much fun. So I don't know if you want to talk more about it than. You would know better than I since you built it. Yeah, so this was, uh, this map actually, I think, only came to light because I, I set my own rules while I was working on it. Uh, I'd probably thrown out about maybe 40 or so uh, revisions on different <laughs> ideas before I uh, sort of cemented something. And uh, what I did was I, I made a couple of restrictions for myself before I started. Uh, where I said I was going to try to build the majority of the space and try to lock it in uh, using sort of two two levels to the main map as far as z-axis and uh, cut in half by like a half level. So most of the map, if if you really kind of inspect it, is either on sort of like a level zero, level 0 0.5, or level one uh, on z-axis, and um, and there are a few deviations from there once it sort of gelled, but. Uh, because I, I kind of have a tendency to uh, start with an idea, then have an, another wild idea that might work, <laughs> and start exploring that, and Stay then it, focused, it, it gets Stay out of control really quickly, and then you end up with this like Swiss cheese level, um, which you know sometimes you can be proud of, but generally it's like you'll ask people to play test your level, and you're like, yeah, I connected all these things, isn't that amazing? Yeah, that, that was one of the things that you and I talked about yeah. a little bit early on. Is is he he would show me a, a build of the map and, and ask what I thought and. Some of the earlier stuff, I don't think this one is at all, but some of the earlier stuff, we talked about it feeling overconnected because yeah. it was, and I think a lot of that has to do with um, not only the gameplay of, of how you funnel people um, and, and kind of guide them to where you want them to go, um, but also from a player perspective of being, a, being able to predict where other people are going to go. Um, and then also, as, as Steve mentioned earlier, is learning how to get around a map. If, if if there is no way to get around a map other than go everywhere at any point, then there's not a whole lot of gameplay there. Um, you really want to kind of focus things on what happens in this this one space, and then how does this space connect to the next? Yeah, it can get to be a very hardcore uh, level that only the most dedicated will be able to play. Mm -hmm. And um, if you if you start to get over connected, um, there's a UT map, and I'm blanking on what it was called now, but uh, by um, Faceless. Uh, that was like 
it was it, it was almost like a master class in connectivity. Uh, <laughs> now I'm blanking on what it was called. But at the same time, you play that map, and it's really hard to learn it. Um, anyway, I'll try to remember, and maybe I'll post it post to the forums, forums or something. Um, and uh, uh, it was, I mean, it was a really cool map, but at the same time, it was like you had to spend time learning it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I mean, sir, anybody that's got access to the build, certainly jump in there and play test this one. We wanted to try to get a few other elements in there, um, mostly for some of the pickups that we're getting in there. Uh, so it's got jump boots, it's got uh, different power-ups, like shield belt, you damage. It's got a berserk in there. Oh, does it? Uh, yeah, the berserk. Yeah, it's got, uh, so it's got quite a few of those things in there that people can start to play test. Um, and of course, it's got some platformy gameplay, different wall dodges, and things you can do in there uh, that you can do. Lift utilize. jumps. Yeah, Always lift practice jump. your lift jumps. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So, They're great on this map, too. Love yeah. the lift jumps on this one. Yeah, that's one of those things. It's like jump pad or lift, or lift, because the lift gives you potential for a. Uh, a lift jump. Yeah. yeah. But if you but, go near uh, the lift jumps, you have to be careful because Matt's always there with the shock <laughs> <laughs> right out of the air. Yeah. <laughs> Although the, the jump pads are something else that I wanted to bring up just because we haven't really played with them that much yet. But uh, I do want to start incorporating those kind of things more into a lot of our maps as we move on so we can figure out ways to not make them a one-off gimmick that's used in one map, right. um, but make them more a part of the actual game. Um, you know, if, if, I'm not saying we are, but if we go down the road of not being the jumpy floaty game that 2K4 was, we still want to enable a lot of those mobility options and whether that comes through wall dodging, whether that comes through jump pads, whether it comes through rocket jumping, whether that comes through jump pad or, uh, lift jumps and jump pads, all those things can make you just as mobile, but you, yeah. they're just different ways to learn and add a little bit more depth to the game. Um, so there's there's a lot of potential there. I've been finding just a ton of possibilities by um, incorporating movement through your map skill movement uh, via wall dodging, whether it's wall dodge gaps or uh, wall dodge ledges, um, being able to you know get up to some place that you can't single jump or mm -hmm. yeah. and there's just so much potential there and it feels good when you're playing it or at least I think so that's my opinion. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't feel like you're just getting flung really far across the space. It feels deliberate. Um, and so if you're creating, uh, testing out your idea, look for some of those possibilities where like, oh, I can only get from here to there if I wall dodge off of this wall or, you know, um, and, and that kind of stuff is fun to figure out as a player too. Yeah. yeah. And even, I mean, right now we have uh, the ability to chain wall dodges and there's been a, a few places where I found where there's cool combos you yeah. can do that are... Um, they require both. And actually, the other thing, I was when I was doing the slope dodging this morning, um, I was finding some places where I could slope dodge and then wall dodge. Wall off dodge, and, you know, yeah. Cool. <laughs> oh, that's going to be annoying to me. <laughs> uh, moving yeah. around me. All right, cool. Uh, so I think that's all we had in terms of level design, high-level advice. But uh, we did have some questions. We Stacey do have some questions. I might and also, if you have any more, these. feel free to throw them in chat. Cameron's sitting there watching you guys yeah. right now and can pass Yeah, and there were, cool. there were so many questions. So we're also going to jump into the, the, um, the forum later. Not, okay, maybe, cool. maybe not today, and yeah. answer some more of the questions on there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so how many maps are we currently looking at shipping? And this is from Azure. Um, with the initial playable release, alpha or otherwise, and will they all be DM? And are we going to think about CTF too? Um, I think... I mean, I guess, I guess for the so alpha is going to be, you know, pretty small and basically going to be our kind of a, a, a more public test of the gameplay mechanics. And still, I mean, it, we, this won't be an example of us feeling like we finished the gameplay mechanics, but it's just a wider test and we'll, we'll revise and get feedback based on that. In terms of maps, I mean, I think at least we'll, we, we do plan to have CTF. Um, I think that's a, a different kind of gameplay that's a pretty core to, the, to UT as well. Um, and I think, you know, at least two maps for each one and kind of depends on, you know, how many maps we can get to the polish level and that can show off different aspects of gameplay that we want. Yeah, we're, we're still trying to kind of set the boundaries of what the alpha is going to be as a whole. Yeah. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that, that number is locked down by any means. Yeah. Um, but I think what we, the, uh, at least from my perspective, uh, the best way to put it is that we'll we'll put as many as we need to prove out our ideas and whether that's, you know, different size maps for different numbers of players or different types yeah. of games, whether it's CTF, DM, Team DM, whatever, um, we'll do 
kind of what we need to do pr to prove out those ideas and then throw the alpha out and, and, and do the wider net test of getting more players in and testing networking and testing yeah. the UI and, and all of those things. And then we'll gather all that feedback and come back and then hopefully start yeah. actually building the more expensive game. Yeah. Yeah, and those spaces will be the kinds of environments that we can sort of learn from as yeah. people play it, yeah. and um, they probably won't be one-trick ponies, I guess. Yeah. Uh, sure. So it needs to be something where it it sort of encompasses uh, the, the the spectrum of gameplay. So yeah, a, a good target for me has has been to look at what we've done with our previous UT demos. You know, they've all been three or four maps, um, and kind of in that range. So yeah. we'll probably do something similar. Okay. Uh, Num51 is uh, very impressed with the BSP shells, and he would like to know if we could make some tutorials on uh, making advanced brushes. He just didn't know that those types of things existed. <laughs> Dave is the BSP master. Uh, if there's a couple tips, and, and <laughs> that I'm sure we can, yeah, there's some tricks and other things about uh, doing some things with BSP. So, yeah, I'm sure we could put a vi video together. And, and we have a wonderful team kind of, of tech writers now, too, and we can talk to them and maybe have them do a tutorial yeah. for yeah, us. Yeah, the, the one thing I would say is if you're, if you're in the editor, um, where you drag and drop your primitives into the maps, um, there is the ability to go and actually edit them. Um, so you can like clip off corners and kind of reshape them and rescale yeah. them and do things. So um, it's not as complicated as it seems really when you, once you figure that tool out, um, you can start doing some, some better shapes. And, and UE4 is significantly better than some of the other um, versions of our engine have been with regards to not creating holes or really bad errors with BSP, so you can actually flush things out a bit. Um, yeah. But at the same them. time, don't go crazy. Um, <laughs> understand that... Uh, Use the grid. Yeah, yeah stay on the grid. <laughs> Geometry will, and math is your friend. It's, you know, th there's a reason that, it, that, that um, we build these maps to be at the certain angles and, and scale that we do. Um, and when you get to be too crazy with shapes and stuff, then sometimes it just gets really hard to um, adjust them visually, or you have to build custom assets, or those sorts of things, which is fine if that's if that's your goal is to build an entire map from top to bottom. But um, the stock assets that come with it will, will generally be we try and do as much reuse as possible, so things are built to a very specific kind of shape and scale and and level of complication that it also doesn't affect performance. So either JO plus or JOPolis, I'm not sure which one it is. Sorry about that. Uh, he says, I'm going to say really <laughs> It sounds really cool, doesn't it? So, Jopolis asks, I remember the days of 2K4 and UT3. Horances had this helpful tip for dimensions, such as wall distances, ceiling heights, etc. Um, they were not set in stone, but they were set as kind of guidelines. Do we have anything similar to that that we're willing to share with everyone? Uh, so, I, yeah, I've recently started a uh, making a level that we can... Uh, use and compare based off of adjusting movement and things that actually encompasses some of these things. So it's a little bit of an obstacle course of uh, sp testing specific scales and showcasing them and we're using the render text feature so that I can update the numbers and things to, to tell you like, hey, this is actually 200 units or whatever. So uh, I'll be posting that into the build um, for people to be able to look at and awesome. just spawn in and run around. Um, and again, it is just guidelines. I think uh, most of what you'll see in there will, will mainly be like, here is the extreme, or here is the minimum, uh, or maximum. Uh, and, um, and certainly you can, uh, you can go somewhere you know, in between the min and the max if you want. Um, uh, but it'll be useful information so that you can sort of bypass needing to learn specific numbers. Yeah, okay. if, there's, if there's anything specific that people are looking for, um, once they look at the map, let us know. We may have missed something in terms of, you know, how far can I triple wall dodge? Something like, I don't know. Yeah. Right? Like, uh, so let us know if, if it's yeah, not Yeah, please there. let us know. And also, uh, for consistency, should everyone be using uh, the Steve UT character for yes. sizing? Yes. That, I mean, that, so the Steve UT character right now is, is our default movement, but we're still experimenting with that. Um, and, you know, certainly... I mean, yeah, if you're trying to build a level, but you should expect, I mean, it's subject to change. I mean, I, I made some tweaks to it today. Every day we're making some yeah. changes to it. We yeah, play it, test it. It's actually worth pointing out that prior to last week, uh, we were kind of 
we were experimenting with our own characters and setting up our own maps and doing other things, and so the maps that we checked in weren't consistent. Um, now they're all set to use uh, that by default. Steve's UT character by by default. Yeah. Um, so if you want to make changes, that's the kind of a one-stop shop that you can go to and yeah. mess with. Yeah, and if you're not sure, go into the world settings. There's a world settings button uh, up near the top of the editor, and just double check that your character, your default game type. You can actually wipe it and just set it to default, and you will get the correct settings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if you have it overridden, um, you may be using the incorrect character. Yeah. So just double check it in your in your level. Um, Historian asks, um, one of my favorite games is Shoot Mania, and at the beginning, it will take a fly through of the map and mm -hmm. show you the map so you know what it mm -hmm. looks like. Um, is it possible for us to be able to do that in UT at some point? Yeah, anybody can do that. You just need to set up a matinee sequence in your map and do a little fly through with the camera. Um, that process hasn't changed from pre previous versions of the engine, really. Pardon me. Um, so if, yeah, if you want to, you can absolutely yeah. do it. It's a, it's a great way to show off your map in the forums, cool. too, right? Like, just say, hey, here's a quick fly through. People can see what each of the different areas looks like. Um, and then decide whether or not they want to go play it. Yeah. And frankly, I mean, one of the things that we're talking about, I mean, and we need to figure out if this is possible and how we do it, but uh, I mean, I'd love to see us able to, to show you know, videos, I mean, whether it's YouTube or some other kind of encoding uh, from within the game so that people can make a little video of their fly through so you can look, you know, you can see a fly through the map without having to load the whole map. Uh, also, people could create tutorials for different weapons or different, you know, game types. I mean, even a tutorial for know, cool features of your map, and we could, you know, it'd be great if those could be easily embedded in the, in the game itself, so, yeah. yeah. So something we'll look into. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Dan Paz 3 d asks, so will you be using traditional level design methods, or will, be, will you be introducing new methods and taking some risks? Yeah. We, we were joking earlier. <laughs> <laughs> does, does that, are you asking, are we going to make crappy maps again? I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what that means by traditional methods as opposed to new methods. But uh, well, one one thing he does ask is, will there be levels with heavy environmental environmental damage, like uh, the ocean floor or danger? Yeah, so I mean, we we definitely sharks. I, I don't know what'll happen in the initial demo that we send out, the alpha version. But eventually, yeah, I mean, we, that's one of the things UT was known for was it has its gimmick maps, it has its trap maps. Um, and those are some of the most memorable things in the game. Will they be in every map? No. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to get a couple really good memorable maps that, that aren't there just for the sake of a gimmick, but actually add to the gameplay and do something cool. Um, and again, I mean, part of the beauty of UT is that there is really no method. There is, there's, it's, it's chaos. It's organized chaos. So if you want to try something that you consider to be experimental, go for it. I would love to yeah. see as many different ideas as we can. I mean, maybe we'll find something we didn't even think of um, and it can become a core part of the game. Uh, yeah. So. yeah, I think one of the things to, to realize, I mean, I mean the, the, the core UT that, that, that we're you know, going to be kind of controlling in GitHub is, is relatively small, but you know, with the, the marketplace for Unreal Tournament, um, everybody will be able to put whatever maps and weapons and mods and game types in. And so there'll be this, this really dynamic greater UT that basically what UT is depends on what people create and what people are playing. And you know, if you create a map that's really that has really different gameplay than what we've done before and that becomes really popular, well, you know, I mean effectively it becomes that. part of core UT and, and probably even explicitly we'll probably bring things in because they've you know they've clearly touched a chord with the community. Yeah. I mean so the, so that's one of the ways, you know, in addition to being able to and, and we're encouraging people of course to directly contribute, but I think also organically like that, the community will decide what Unreal Tournament is. Yeah, we try and stick within kind of the very, very loose fiction of the universe, but online bathroom, you know, where you, you were the size of <laughs> yeah. a bar of soap. And yeah, it, that's it, what we need more of. It's <laughs> always been a classic, uh, and, you know, going back to UT99, uh, what was TTF? Thorns. Thorns. Oh. Uh, was another one where you were, you were tiny. And, uh, and action. Yeah. So, that was like, this, like a thorns, only smaller. Yeah, so, so, I mean, the, 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 you can do anything with it. I mean, there's, there's no... Yeah, I, I assume that's what that person meant about. Are we going to? And now with our lighting, methods? we can make really realistic-looking bathrooms. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> physical materials. It actually looks like. Yeah. Dementierge. I need to find questions with some more simple names. Dementierge. Um, Dementierge. Thank you. He asks, that's "Is there cool anything name. you'll you definitely don't want level designers to do?" <laughs> There's a long list of things we don't want people to do, but at the same time. 
I want people to do everything. No, yeah, I, there's uh, actually quite a few questions in here. Yes, yeah. he what has separates good maps from great maps? High contrast, and yeah, there's a couple good points. I'm sure we could hit them one after another. But uh, I've been. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, what separates good maps from great maps? I sort of touched on this a little bit earlier, but you know, think about what is actually fun in the game yeah. and the core elements of the game, and make sure that your map is is providing that. And then the other thing that I think separates, uh, you know, good maps from great maps is iteration. Um, you know, the uh, some of the maps, it's like you're going over it with a, you know, a sort of fine tooth comb, like get all the little details right. Uh, I remember, I think you were looking over my shoulder the other day, and, and I was like balancing the position of pickups or something mm. and trying to triangulate them, and you're, and you're like, oh, you're doing that already? And it's yeah, like, you yeah. know. Uh, it's a kind of one of those steps that you do before you're before you're We're done. We're looking at like the dis how many steps or how many seconds yeah. does it take to get from one pickup to the next and all that kind of stuff. Measuring yeah. the distance between health vials and all yeah. this other stuff, and it's just you know uh, attention to detail and iteration. I think really is is what's going to set your map apart, and that involves getting people to play test it, getting their opinions, and you know knowing when to sort of be humble and when to stick to your guns and whether yeah. you're going to make changes or not. Yeah. Generally speaking, if you don't have a plan it, and you just kind of throw something together, it's going to look and feel like it was just thrown together. Um, but the things that are, that are well planned out um, have and, and, and built for a reason tend to be more memorable and stick around long term. And I think that's kind of one of the things. One of the, that another thing that mind. he asks is, um, should a map be completely leak proof or can we just stomp dead anyone who escapes from the ant farm? <laughs> I personally prefer to, in, in this early stage of development, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. But right. uh, in a final product, yeah, I definitely want to keep them as leak-proof as possible. Um, I've seen some really, really good maps, not just in UT, but just generally speaking, some really, really fantastic maps that were ruined because somebody got out of it and ruined everybody else's experience. Right. And once that happens, it becomes the thing to do, and then nobody can ever play that map ever again. Um, and so I've seen some, some great maps kind of go down in flames because of that. Yeah, I would just say try to be consistent there. Like if there's a spot, even if it's just a ledge that you can run off the edge of the map and, you know, you do have a kill volume and they, no one's going to get out of it and break the map, but, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a boundary. It's, it's something where, you know, I think it makes sense to, to sort of have a, a certain amount of the map that works that way. Like you look at something like uh, face or barricade or something like that and there's a whole lot of walk off the edge of this yeah. and you're going to die. Um, and that's uh, actually part of the gameplay. Yeah. yeah, and it's part of the gameplay. But when it's just like, oh, if you run in this hallway and round the corner and you're too close to the outside, you might fall over. That's you know, that's where you're going to ask yourself, mm -hmm. is it really adding value? You might be better off adding a little fence there and making a nice vista that you see, but make it hard to actually kill yeah. yourself. Yeah, and it's I mean, and it's not only the people who do it intentionally. Where oh, uh, I know I can get out of the map, so I'll go grab the flag and then you know ruin everybody else's game by hiding with it or whatever. But also the people who do it unintentionally, where they fall through and die and didn't mean to, or hey, I was on a kill streak and then I actually found this spot and got out of the map, and now what do I do? And I'm stuck. And so yeah. you, you just want to make it yeah. as 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 clean and and straightforward a a, a game of a, a level as possible. Yeah. So uh, Dementi Urge also asks, uh, high contrast and dynamic lighting look amazing, but are they acceptable for an arena shooter? Which is a very good question. Um, yes, it is. It's, it's definitely possible to uh, ruin a perfectly good pot uh, potential gameplay arena uh, with lighting that is hard for your eyes to perceive. Yeah. Um, and uh, that could just be high contrast lighting. It could be noisy lighting. Um, it could be colors that make it hard to see uh, characters, um, which was definitely something, you know, when lights affect player models, it, um, you know, it, it can sometimes leave characters in sort of camouflage a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so you just have to sort of test your lighting um, and not let it stand just because it looks cool yeah. if it, if it yeah. is Not to open a can of worms, yeah. but that's how we end up with things like bright skins because people can't see characters. And we want to make sure right. that you can... And there you, goes that can. If there's, if there's, <laughs> if there's, you know, if there's dark areas in the yeah. map, make sure they're there for a reason and they have a gameplay purpose. Like you want pe players to hide there, understand that people are going to, or if you want players to stand out against the background, that make sure that they do that, so that there's some depth with fog or background or shapes or whatever it is. Um, like all of those things really do matter. 
um, especially in a very frantic gameplay situation. Yeah, earlier we were talking about how putting a couple objects in your world gives you sort of scale reference, and lighting can do the same thing. If you have a long hallway, you might decide to have the ends of the hallway dark and put a light in the middle of it. And if you stand at one end of the hallway, you're going to see dark, light, dark. Yeah. And it's going to give you a sense of distance across that hallway, even if there are no objects in there at all. And so try to think of it practically rather than just something along the lines of, uh, oh, well, I put this grate in the ceiling and there's a light behind it and it's going to cast this really cool shadow. And, and sometimes that's disruptive. Sometimes it's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. So just be willing to sort of double check it. Yeah. Last but not least, Asula asks, will we see some S... <laughs> I'm sorry. Asymmetry. <laughs> <laughs> I will <Asymmetry>. see so. <laughs> <laughs> Will we see some asymmetries? <laughs> CTF maps that are same on the both sides. Map, so. <laughs> and will we see side switching? <laughs> <laughs> I think that is a very important part of CTF. Um, it, even, even if we ourselves don't build asymmetrical maps, we still need to think of that in the process in terms of, oh, when the, when the sides swap, um, you know, how can you cre create a fair, competitive experience, so we have to put the systems in place to swap sides and do all those sorts of things. Yeah. And, and in theory, we will remember all those sorts of things when it comes down in to it, whether yeah. or not we end up making those asymmetrical maps ourselves. Personally, I love asymmetrical CTF maps. Same they here, because I know where I'm going yeah. on the balanced. other side. It, it, well, that's yeah. the thing. That's it's like there's such a yeah, challenge to, to balance, actually build and balance. It's worth it if you can pull it off. Um, but, yeah. you know, and there's a middle ground, too, uh, which is uh, to actually use the, the middle of the map and maybe make that asymmetrical rather than uh, the bases. Um, or to have the majority of the map be symmetrical, except for uh, a couple, key except areas, for a couple yeah. key areas, or the bases are a very small part of the overall size. There's just a whole lot of, of in betweens that don't. Ha it doesn't have to be, um, you know, sort of night and day between the, yeah. the sides of the map. And if you go back to the original UT99, I mean, that was there were a lot of asymmetrical maps there, and I think that was that was awesome. I mean, those yeah. are some of still to this day. Some of the. November, you know, is still one of the classic UT maps of, of yeah. all time. Uh, Command and uh, even Lava Giant. Yes. Yeah. You know, the bases and slight differences in the midfield, that's which, asymmetrical. Which Lava led Giant. to some really annoying and horrible clan matches, but at the same time, yeah. um, I, it, I think there are ways that we can, we can balance it. Now, so. All right, that's all I have. Um, we were really surprised to find that 30,000 of you listened to the podcast last week. Uh, keep listening. Uh, you can either download the MP3 on our blog at unrealtournament.com, or you can get it on iTunes, or you can just listen on the blog. Uh, the stream will be up on YouTube soon, and keep watching the forums, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye. everybody. <laughs>